I would say, um, you know, because the Midwest mentality, <laughs> you know, you're kind of taught to stay at a job. You just, you need to stay there, stay there a year. Or, you know, I mean, a year would be nothing in the Midwest. It'd be you'd stay there six years <laughs> and then, then you can move to a new job. That is absolutely false. Um, you know, I do not recommend jumping from job to job to job, but if you are not, if you are in a position where someone is either verbally, physically, or just truly mentally being inappropriate with you. I mean, I tr I had a woman, she was screaming obscenities at me, then grabbed a tissue box and put it in front of me. I, now, mind you, I was not crying. But she made it very clear, I'm trying to make you cry. Mm. And I waited till she was done calmly. And then I grabbed the tissue box, I put it right back in front of her calmly. And I just said, I will never need that here. Welcome to the Amani Experience Podcast. In this podcast, you will experience wisdom, advice, and stories from creatives all over the world. Your host is Amani Roberts, who is a DJ, music producer, professor, avid book reader, and developing salsa dancer. On the show, we love to share the stories of creative professionals, especially people who have gone from the corporate life to the creative life. Once again, welcome to the Amani Experience Podcast. Welcome to episode 31 of the Amani Experience Podcast. For this show, we have Kachita Hines from Style on the Spot. I love this episode. There's many things that to like about it, lots of wisdom and advice. Some of the things that I really enjoyed was how Kachita talked about how she mentors young professionals and speaks at local colleges. She has great fashion events, so I loved her talking about that and the concept behind each of them. She also told some thought-provoking stories about her time in corporate America, which were really um, transparent, so I appreciate that. And then she gave me some great fashion advice. So I hope you enjoy this show. I'm going to read to you a review from Fast Sick. It says, great show. Amani is a natural. The content is solid and informative. It is short and to the point, just like I like it. I recommend this podcast to anyone that enjoys understanding how corporate to creative young professionals think. Thank you very much for that review. Please feel free to hop onto iTunes and give a review and give us a rating. We might read your review at one of our shows. Now. It's time to get to the show. Thank you very much for listening, and here we go. Welcome back to the show. I'm going to read our guest bio for today, and then we'll get right to the show. Our guest today is an L.A.-based fashion and lifestyle blogger, stylist, plus a marketing and branding expert. She explores current trends for fashionably savvy ladies and gentlemen through style on the spot. She has previously participated or done on-camera reporting for the likes of NBC, MGM, and BET and handle marketing at MGM Movie Studios and Netflix, I'd like to welcome Kachita Hines to the Amani Experience podcast. Hi, happy to be here. We are happy to have you. So I love to do a geographic check-in whenever so we can let everyone know out there where we're talking from. So where are we today? We are in El Segundo, California, right by the beach and the beautiful weather that is Los Angeles, California. Yes, this is true. And where did you grow up? I actually grew up, I was born in Atlanta, Georgia, grew up partially there, and then mostly in Lincoln, Nebraska. Lincoln, Nebraska. Go Big Red. Go Big Red. But if I recall correctly, for school, you went to University of Missouri, correct? That's right. I'm a Missouri Tiger. <laughs> You're a Tiger. <laughs> and you went to their really popular and famous school of journalism, correct? That is correct. Um, number one journalism school in the world. Super proud of that. <laughs> it was cutthroat, but it was worth it. This is true. How did you decide to go from growing up in Lincoln, Nebraska, you know, kind of across or halfway across the country a little bit to Missouri, Columbia? You know, um, when I was in high school, I kind of, I knew at a young age I wanted to do something in entertainment and I started checking out colleges and I, um, I, I thought for sure I'd go somewhere near home. You know, my parents were a little like, oh, we can't have our baby girl go too far away. <laughs> so I had looked at a bunch of colleges and I'm sitting there with my dad and I hadn't gone to Mizzou, check out Mizzou yet. And, um, and I'm, we're sitting in the Dean's office at KU and he's talking and I was having, having that moment where I felt like I was Charlie Brown and all I was hearing was like, wah, 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 wah. <laughs> and behind him, I noticed that his uh, diploma was um, framed and it said University of Missouri Journalism School. <laughs> and I kind of abruptly just looked at him and I said, did you graduate from the University of Missouri? And he looked at me and said, yeah. And I looked at my dad and I said, 
I know where we need to go. <laughs> and so I went to, I went to visit and just knew it was home. And then, you know, from there, the story continued. I graduated and um, I came out to Los Angeles during spring break as a senior to do informational interviews with alumni and just check out, see if it was where I was meant to be. Cause I had thought it would be New York, but, um, I came out here and within the first 24 hours knew I was meant to live in Los Angeles. And actually, um, from that and meeting an alumni many months later, um, right after graduation, got a call that I had gotten a job and had two weeks to move out to Los Angeles uh, right. um, for a job at E! Entertainment, actually. Right. Cool. That was back in 2002. Yeah. But thanks for dating me. school, you were... <laughs> I'm not dating you, but you're <laughs> still very young. Don't worry. <laughs> but during school, you worked at the NBC affiliate, correct? Yes, I did. I did. I actually um, reported and anchored there. And um, the great thing about that was it wasn't just a you know school television station. It was a legitimate yeah. NBC <laughs> affiliate. I mean, every time you went on air, you just you it, there were a lot of people watching to the point that um my after my freshman year of college I um was basically interning at the station I had kind of knew I needed to get my foot in the door and so was interning for the morning cut-ins now mind you that meant I had to be there at like four something yes. five something a.m yes. um and anyone who knows me knows I'm not a morning <laughs> person but it goes to show you must really love something if it can get you out of bed that early and so I was there and the anchor for morning cut-ins um wasn't able to make it and to the uh -oh. station. So the news director kind of came running into me and I, I'd been, you know, helping produce the, the morning stuff. So I'd been writing the stories and everything was ready to go. And he kind of looked at me and was like, threw a, like literally threw a blazer at me and goes, <laughs> go put some makeup on. You're going on camera. And I was like, what? Wow. And so that was my first experience. So I was very fortunate that I got to start early. Um, and that was the beginning of it all. Yes, I mean, you were a very young age on the TV screen, yep. NBC Channel 4. I mean, where I grew up, NBC was Channel 4. So. <laughs> yeah, KOMU. There you go. So, wow. <laughs> so then after E! Entertainment, you went to, and it's called like Bunham Murray Productions? Yes. And Buna Murray, um, actually, um, it wasn't until I started working there that I found out that one of the founders um, was actually a University of Missouri grad. Mm -hmm. And so from that moment on, I, I felt like there was that constant, um, you know, tiger connection that continued um post post college and so you know murray um is directly affiliated at the time was directly affiliated affili affiliated with nbc and mtv and so i worked on the real world um road rules wow. and a show many of you may know the simple life with paris and nicole <laughs> and had um experiences there that i could write a book on nice <laughs> How was Paris and Nicole? How was working with them? Um, you know what? It was it was as if I every time they were around um, and some of the experiences just um, when they would even just when they would come for meetings in office, it was as if I was stepping into an alternate universe. You know, at the time it wasn't we weren't that far off, you know, age wise from each other. And um, and I remember years later seeing Paris, I would see her out at parties and clubs <laughs> And she was, they were both extremely nice, but to them going out to lunch and dropping, you know, $300, $400 was no big deal. Whereas I was like eating <laughs> whatever free food they would give me. at Ramen. <laughs> Ramen. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. And then after that, you were at NBC Universal, TAG, MGM, and Netflix. Yes. So I, um, I really enjoyed my experience there. I actually made some lifelong friends and, um, and peers that helped um, push me through my career at that young of an age and as well at, at E! and the Style Network. Um, and so from there, I went on to kind of move forward. I knew I wanted to no longer be in reality TV, but be in movie on the movie side and continue on camera work. So I was doing on camera work um, wherever I could, you know, whoever would hire me on the weekends or late yeah. nights for premieres or parties. Um, whether you saw my face or just my hand, I was, I was there <laughs> and all over. Um, and the funny thing is, is, you know, there's this facade of, of what that lifestyle is, but I'll tell you, it was crazy and they paid basically nothing. That's why I kept my day job and, um, moved forward. And as my father said, you need to have a 401k and you must have <laughs> insurance. You're getting too old to be on my insurance. So, um, so that's when I, you know, I knew for many years, um, 
if I was going to work for a movie studio, there was one place, and that was the home of my favorite movie, The Wizard of Oz, okay. and that was MGM. So nice. I um, basically went in for the interview and said, there was an assistant job open, and I said, I don't even care what it's for. I don't care what you need me to do. I will do whatever it takes, and I'll be the best assistant you've ever had here at MGM. And the lady was like, I don't know if you want this. This is a really boring job. <laughs> <laughs> it was actually for, it was an assistant job for the legal team. And I looked at her and I said, you know what? My dad's a lawyer. Does that help? And she said, done. You, the job's yours. So I was like, okay, great. And um, for a few weeks, I worked my tail off. And I have to tell you, I worked with some really lovely, amazing people. Um, one of the lawyers I still see here today in Manhattan Beach every once in a while with his family. But um, I, someone had been watching me and that, um, that kind of, that led me to the next phase. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Cool. So you're with MGM. Yes. But you know, back, you started your company style on spot back in like 2002. And so you've, you've been around for a long, long time or go ahead. Sorry. So let me backtrack a little bit. Mm -hmm. So when I say someone was watching me at MGM, I had a boss who, um, Actually, we'll come up. We'll come back to that. Okay. But we'll okay. come back to that. But so yeah, I started Style on the Spot. <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> I started Style on the Spot in two thousand and three. Three. Okay. Um, I had worked at MGM for many years and had truly hit the ceiling there, um, to the point where there was no way to get any higher than I had gotten, and um, I got an offer actually to work at the Weinstein Company, and um, luckily Netflix came after me and um i took the job with netflix instead thank the lord but um, <laughs> that's a whole another story is, and but i agree yeah and so i went on um to work at netflix as their content marketing manager um overseeing latin america but also i helped them build a dam which is a digital asset management system oh. and um really helped try to also bridge some of their relationships with studios and digital partners like Xbox and yeah. PlayStation that I had good um, relationships with. And um, it got to the point where I looked around and the women that were in my position or higher, many of them were not living the life that I saw myself wanting to work toward. Um, and also too, I knew it was meant to be an entrepreneur. So I got a very wonderful opportunity to start my own company. So that was in 2003. 2003. How did you know you wanted, you wanted to be an entrepreneur? I had worked in, from the moment I got out of college, I had worked for someone else. I had worked very hard. I mean, you know, I've got that Midwest blood in me and I truly um, am, I have a lot of drive and passion. And when I work, I work hard and I, for years, I knew I was making other people a lot of money. And I knew that. I knew I was taking my job, no matter what it was, seriously. And I also had learned, you know, from the bottom up, if you, you, can be, you can be anyone and do any job, as long as you know what everyone is doing beneath you, at your level and above you, you can go anywhere. And, but it's also respecting those people. So I got to a point where I was just like, I am ready to truly... I'm tr ready to be my own boss. I'm ready to have vacations. I'm ready to be able to not like be told truly as an adult, like when I can go eat and when I can use the restroom. Cause that for many of us that have been in corporate America, it sounds insane, but I mean, there were days that it was, it was quite crazy. And when I look back on, I mean, for any of you that have watched the devil wears Prada, um, I, that was my job when I first started at MGM. Mm. Um, when I say you never know who's watching you, um, the president of the studio had been watching me. And when I was for you know, two weeks in, was, had been watching me, brought me into his office. And I thought, oh my God, I've been here two weeks. Am I getting fired? <laughs> and like, why would the president be calling me in his office? So I went in and he was so lovely. And, um, and he offered me a job to be as an assistant, his assistant. And it was to be his second assistant. His first assistant was pregnant, lovely woman. And so she was going to be training me. So the next day I come in, it's supposed to be my first day of training for, you know, months. And she left to a doctor's appointment and never came back. Oh. <laughs> and so oh. never came back. So um, from then on, 
I always I always joked that the devil didn't wear Prada. The devil wore Hugo Boss because he <laughs> loved Hugo Boss. But he was not the devil. He was actually a really amazing, inspiring boss. But in the sense of like, there was a Bible for every day that every day that was printed at each day for his calendar for the next year. Wow. There were I mean there were times where I'd have to stay late to roll calls with him, and I would nap under my desk until he was ready for the next call. Like it was insane. <laughs> Insanity. <laughs> wow. Thanks yeah. for sharing. So 2003 and then in 2014, you kind of decided to kind of jump all in and go for it. What kind of made you make that decision? So I got to the point where I knew um, I'd gotten a bunch of job offers. And so it was, do I go work for another studio or do I take this leap of being my own boss, calling the shots and, and really, truly kind of making my own future. And, um, and I just took the leap. I had the opportunity where I'd had previous bosses and coworkers that kind of had my back and said, just do it. If there's anyone who has that drive, who could work from home, who could really, and also it's the networking drive. So it was that moment where I just said, I need to do this for myself, but also for my future and for my future family that I, you know, um, wanted to start. And yes. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. You mentioned networking. How has networking benefited your career throughout its entirety? Because you're an extremely talented networker and that's kind of a lost art nowadays. So how has it benefited your career and your company? Well, when it comes to networking, I have learned that it you should never go out and network and expect that you're going to get something from someone. So, because that's when it's not genuine. And I think people can feel that. Um, I've been lucky to meet so many wonderful people. And like I've said to you, good people know good people. It can be very hard to <laughs> find good people, but yeah. when you do find them, hold them near and dear to your heart because good people know other good people. And um, what I've learned is, and especially owning my own company and doing marketing and events, People want that human to human contact. They want a personalized experience. And that is what's lacking in our society today. So um, being somebody that's from the entertainment, the technology side, but also fashion side, and you've got all these very different minds. One thing that's consistent across the board is that with technology, it's taking away some of that personalized experience. And I can tell you without a doubt, you know, it comes down to when I have meetings, putting the cell phone away, mm -hmm. um, you know, when a call comes in, really listening because you can miss one thing that somebody might say that could be an opportunity, not just for you, but for them. And so when I, when I network, I really think about how can I help this person, not how can they help me and truly, um, leaps and bounds. It, it has always come back. Yeah. And I, I'm a big believer in that. If you're a good person, good things will come to you. Yeah, because like, the same people you see on the way up, as my mother says, <laughs> the same people you see on the way up are the same people you see on the way down. So, you know, and I will tell you, I've seen some of the people who were quite horrible right. on their way down on my way up. Yeah. And and I will tell you, it's it's really been a beautiful, though, experience to the people who have been good to me to continue to be good to them and really support one another. Yeah. The universal law. Preach. Can I get an amen on a Thursday? Amen. <laughs> I love it. So in your opinion, what's important for creative professionals such as yourself, myself to succeed in today's business environment? I would say that it's extremely important in today's environment to be able to succeed. You have to be motivated. You have to stay on top of technology within your field, but also outside of your field. Um, and I say that because, you know, in marketing, you've got social media that's constantly expanding, but it's constantly changing. And, but I always am trying to stay on top of not just in the entertainment field, but in, you know, politics or in finance, what are people doing? Because sooner or later, those technologies could come to my field and affect me, help me, hurt me, whatever it may be um, in some way. True. What have you noticed recently in terms of technology that's kind of catching your eye or you want to keep a closer eye on? As far as technology goes, I, I would say the, the, abil uh, the ability to shop and promote yourself via Instagram right now. I think 
Instagram, Pinterest, the buying power that is there is going to expand because the formats that they have are so user friendly. So if you look at someone like an Amazon, what they've been able to do with Amazon Prime is unreal. I mean, I want some chips and salsa. I can get it in an hour from Amazon. <laughs> Who would have ever thought that, right? Right. And, um, but I, what I would say is someone who's in the fashion space um, and marketing space, I do see Amazon and some companies like that taking on what we've seen Instagram do and Pinterest do and be able to expand their their reach because right now i would not go to amazon to really buy anything but maybe some cons you know converse there because they're cheaper than you know down the road here at the mall (laughs) but besides that their fashion outreach i don't i think what we will see in the next even just year and two years is going to be huge and it is going to be because of the successes of other social media outlets true I'm glad you mentioned Pinterest. That's like a hidden beast, so to speak, out there. (laughs) And I'm really trying to focus on it. What has been your experience with Pinterest and why do you like that platform? Um, I love Pinterest because it's visual. And as somebody who is from the journalism, you know, um, on camera marketing background, I am a visual learner. I'm a visual person. Um, And I would say that I think with Pinterest, it's, it's a way to connect just like any of any other thing, but you can connect directly. Like I can follow someone and, and learn from them things that they they like and are looking for, whether it's, um, and date night outfit that I see them post that then I'm, I think, Oh, I should wear that the next time I go out. Or it's, um, a new pillow from target that looks like a, you know, hundred dollar pillow, but it's, $12.99. Um, and I think it's for inspiration. I think also to, um, it's interesting how you can connect and, and find people that are like-minded very easily. Yeah. Agree. Great answer. So we started 2003. Now we're in 2018. When did you realize like the turning point of your career? When did you realize, okay, this is legit. Like it's going to work. Like it's quote unquote balls to the wall. Like when did you kind of <laughs> realize this is, this is the real thing? You know, I think most people would assume when I decided to say, okay, I'm not going to go work in corporate America and I'm going to be crazy and start my own company. But I would say um, it wasn't when I said, okay, I have a digital marketing agency, um, you know, this boutique firm. It's not that. It's not when I said, hey, I'm going to create this. It was the moment, I would say, about a year and a half ago when I no longer had to um, take on extra clients because I was creating and planning and working enough on things that I was doing, not other people. That was the moment about a year and a half when I was able to look into the mirror and say, I'm here. I am finally where I want to be. I'm working with huge, massive brands from Macy's to Louis Vuitton to Kendra Scott. I'm working with, with brands that not only do I wear like rep, you know, respect, but I want to promote. It was also being able to say to clients that I, I don't have, I can fire clients now. I don't have to keep somebody. You know, if I don't enjoy working with someone, I don't have to do that. And as anyone who is an entrepreneur, any as anyone who is an entrepreneur will know, it it can be really hard the first few years when you are building because you are essentially, it's like you're building a house. You've got to lay down a foundation and that foundation takes always more time than you expect. And then you've got to, you know, go through the plans of what what's next and can this really be stable? And then you've got to start building and the building can sometimes go fast and sometimes go really <laughs> slow. And um, that for me was a life-changing moment when I knew I was finally doing what I'd always dreamed of doing when I was sitting in an office, I won't say where, in an office, (laughs) surrounded by a few women who were crying, adult women crying over being treated horribly by some peers and and realizing this is not my future. And I'm so far from there, which is a great feeling. You are. Congrats. Thanks. So let's go back to when you were building and it's tough, you know, cause we've all been there and we all go through it with certain parts of our business. Mm-hmm. And I think the one thing that many entrepreneurs struggle with is knowing their worth. 
And so like when you're building, you might have to do things at a discount or it's just hard to get your preferred rate. So what did you do to really stick to your worth and know your worth and keep that as a constant as you got to the point where you are now where you can fire a client if you want to? Yeah, I would say that one great takeaway that I learned at Netflix is um, numbers are everything. And when you can prove your value in a number, um, in a, in a fact, whether it's a number or a fact, a statistic, um, that will always help you. It'll help you, um, prove something because when you have a fact that's beyond just me saying, Oh, Hey, by the way, I'm awesome. I throw awesome events. <laughs> Everybody has a fabulous time when they come. Look, that's, that's shown in the photos. You can watch my videos, but I can tell you for a fact. So what I realized early on, um, when I was working with clients outside of just doing the fashion and, and the business that I wanted to do, I would always do recap reports for people. Now that comes from my days at MGM where after every movie, um, I had a boss who who would make me put together her recap reports <laughs> and then act as if she'd done them. Um, so what I will tell you though, and uh, what I will tell you though, is that that was a great learning experience because I learned how to, it, it's something a lot of people, young people don't learn in business till later. And it's a lesson that I would love to pass on is um, CYA and that's cover your ass. And whether it's keep emails tracked, um, you know, if you, let's say you're working on social media, a campaign is you have to follow that. So, right. So track, how many followers did you start with? How many did you end with? How many likes did you get? How, how fast did they come in? Things like that. Those are numbers. Those are valuable. That's valuable information in this day and age. And so, um, I was able to basically, when I started working, there were, there was a lot of trade for trade. Okay. I'll, <laughs> I'll do this event for you, but can you do this for me? Or, you know, can you introduce me to this person, whatever it may have been at the time. And, but I, what I will say though, is those people that I, I did, you know, um, favors for are now owing me even bigger favors and, and it has been great. It's, it's been very valuable. Um, but I will say you do have to know your value. And I, it's one of the things I do a lot of mentoring and I work with old assistants, old interns of mine. I also go to LMU and I speak. And one of the things that's the takeaway from that is that you really, really have to know your value. Um, I think a lot of young women, when they start their careers, they don't know their value. They say yes too much. And so that was the big part of it is when I could start saying no, it's when I knew I can start charging more. Yes. Yes. Preach again on a Thursday. Good. On a Thursday. <laughs> Why do you love what you do? I love what I do because I have the opportunity to, whether it is help someone learn how to put their most fashionable foot forward or help a company build an app that could save lives, um, which I've been fortunate enough to do or put on an event and make someone's week, whether I know it or not. And I would say that I love what I do because I get to wake up every day and I don't have to get in a car and have anxiety because I don't know what kind of climate I'm going to be going into at work. Um, I am creating my own future and it's in my hands. And I know that because it's in my hands, it's going to be taken care of. It's going to be, you know, it's going to be fed constantly. And I'm creating my own path. And someone else isn't doing that for me now. Yes. Tell us about the app that you helped create that saved lives. Can you share? Yeah, I can share. That was actually, so when I, when I started my own company, um, I had a dear friend um, who was at Disney at the time. And she said, I know you need clients. So I know this is really random, but I'm going to introduce you to um, a doctor that's here in Los Angeles. And he's actually a fertility doctor. He's one of the top fertility doctors in the world. And she said, you just look at his website. And it was awful. Um, <laughs> and so I came in, I helped him with his rebranding. I helped him pick out uniforms that were more fashionable for the ladies and just even something like that. They were happier, which, you know, we have a whole bunch of women together. They got to, you got to keep them happy. Yes. And, um, and, 
And so he um, has now since built a hospital in Punta Mita, Mexico. And his name is Dr. Sam Najma, Najma Body. And I actually helped build an app um, that is a 911 app in Punta Mita, Mexico. So you can download the Punta Mita Hospital app if you're in that area traveling, whether you own a home there or you're just visiting. And while you're there, if an emergency happens, you can literally click the button within the app and um, not only will emergency responders come immediately from the hospital, but they will have your location geo you know, tracked. And um, one of the great things with that opportunity is um, the, the hospital itself, previously it would take 45 minutes to an hour to get to a hospital. So there are numerous lives that have been able to be saved since this hospital was built, but just to be able to have a part in it, I helped, I created their logo. I, you know, have done a lot. Of, I created the website and worked with vendors to really create marketing materials to even expand further. And so with that experience, who was a client, one of my first clients that I can't even imagine not working with because I'm more now in the fashion space, but I am able to learn new things that are happening in the medical field that I actually have been able to relay into what I'm doing in the fashion field. And it's, it, it's full circle. I think, um, it goes back to what I was saying before you, you can learn a lot from other fields besides your own. And the same with networking that I've, I've met, you know, from networking for him, I've met some amazing clients that have helped me in the fashion side. Good. Well done. Well done. Thank you. What is something that scares you? I would say what scares me is probably missed opportunities because when you are your own boss, when you are your own company and you are your own platform, you have to create your, your own opportunities. And sometimes you can be so stuck in what you're currently doing or that current project that you forget to look forward. And so I constantly am trying to remind myself, don't just look in the now, look what's next. And then what's going to be after that. I am a believer though, when it comes to creating goals, that it's so good to not shoot too far ahead because then you're going to miss the 10 steps it's going to take to get to that major goal. So I look at it the same way where I try to work, you know, step by step, but I try to always look forward. Good. Now your space, like the fashion space, digital media space, it's very, very crowded. What do you do to kind of rise above the noise and distinguish yourself and apart from your competition? I would say that one of the best ways I've been able to distinguish myself is by keeping a personable relationship and experience with clients and, and also just attendees of my events. Um, I try to make sure that each person's experience is with what, what I would want to experience if I went to an event. So for instance, um, I had an event and, and you, whatever you think will not happen at an event will happen, whether it is, um, a woman passing out because she'd given blood earlier in the day, or it's someone who's gorged themselves on all the free food that you provided that they need to go puke in a receptacle. And you need to make that very calmly happen and then bring in a new trash can, but then also make sure that they don't feel embarrassed, you know, um, because nobody would want that to happen to them. And, um, so, so whether it's something like that, you know, I've, I've really tried to make sure that I remember, you know, I would want to be treated a certain way. So I try to remember to treat others that way. And, and also it goes back to that. Um, really, if I have a way to help a client that I do not benefit off of, it doesn't matter. Like I, I still will try to make that, ex, you know, experience, introduction, whatever it is happen. And, um, and it's definitely helped me along the way. Yeah. And I've been to a few, few of your events and you do what you say you do. So well done. Thanks. How has a failure or an apparent failure set you up for later success? Do you have a favorite failure of yours? This is a hard question because I would say, um, I, 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 yeah, I, I, God, I've, I'm definitely haven't always succeeded, but, um, one of my biggest failures happened, I would say more than once. And that was my younger self, um, back in my younger years, not having a voice. And, you know, there is an environment happening right now that I think is so beautiful. And that is the Me Too movement, because I, I, you know, being from the Midwest, I've had a lot of family members, friends ask me, is this like, is this just a lead? Is it, is it BS? Is it real? And, and I've had to sadly say, yeah, 
it's really real. Um, and I can tell you, I saw things, experienced things at a young age, um, but luckily had enough strength on my own to really be careful about what situations I put myself in, but also what people I surrounded myself with. And I do get that from my parents, you know, um, and I'm very fortunate for that. But one of my biggest fail- failures, I would say, was at a younger age, not having my own voice. So not speaking up for, for myself when there were things going on that were not appropriate. I had an intern at one point who then, and, and at this point I had been out of college probably, oh, five, six years, who was then hired at the exact same level as me mm-hmm. with the only experience was interning for me. Not only that, then and he's a dear friend even to this day, um, but I never stood up for myself. And I do regret that now um, because that wasn't right. And that wasn't fair. And, but I think that that is a story that many, many women have had, whether they're in entertainment or not, is the equality, which I do hope. And, and that's why talking about the current climate, you know, in the future for my own children that I hope to have someday and my friends, children, my family's children, that, that these things will not happen, that there will be more of an eye on things and more of protection. Good. Good answer. Now, you're in the public a lot. You're kind of out there speaking, you know, lots of networking. How do you handle your critics? I would say, you know, it's hard because I wouldn't say I have a lot of critics per se. Um, But I can tell you that in the past, when you think of who are the people that criticize you, I I can take constructive criticism from somebody. um, And I really actually appreciate that. I think it's always good to learn about what you can improve on. It can be hard to hear, but it is good to know. Um, but I would say, you know, as someone who has worked at some really big companies and amazing places and some not so amazing places is, um, I'd say maybe some of my bosses, right? Like, so I've, I've had, I've, I've worked for a, a boss at a company that she was racist. I've worked for a woman that was verbally abusive. And then once actually physically abused, uh, here. And one of the things I learned is your worth is not what someone tells you it, it is. And, um, I was actually bullied by a boss once who, um, she, quite honestly, I don't know if she, she just, I think was jealous of the way I looked mm. and the way I would dress to work, which was very professional. Um, and I, what, what I will tell you though, is, is that my work, I always knew my worth was beyond what those people thought of me. I knew that my, my value and my contribution and my future didn't depend on them. And I think that's a hard thing when you're younger and even when you're really deep in your career is that, um, sometimes we feel like someone above us or can, can decide what our fate is. Only you can decide what your fate is. And Mm -hmm. I do, I do wish that I knew that at a younger age. Any advice to maybe some younger people that maybe, are going through something similar that you would kind of advise them to do to kind of get out of that situation? I would say, um, you know, because the Midwest mentality, <laughs> you know, you're kind of taught to stay at a job. You just, you, you need to stay there, stay there a year. Or, you know, I mean, a year would be nothing in the Midwest. It'd be you'd stay there six years <laughs> and then, then you can move to a new job. That is absolutely false. Um, you know, I do not recommend jumping from job to job to job, but if you are not, if you are in a position where someone is either verbally, physically, or just truly mentally being inappropriate with you, I mean, I tr- I had a woman, she was screaming obscenities at me, then grabbed a tissue box and put it in front of me. I, now, mind you, I was not crying, but she made it very clear, I'm trying to make you cry. Mm. And I waited till she was done calmly, and then I grabbed the tissue box, I put it right back in front of her calmly, and I just said, I will never need that here. Mm -hmm. And, but what I will say is that you don't have to scream. You don't have to yell. You don't have to be rude and you never need to wish ill upon someone else. But I think it's to remember that there's always another opportunity and you can make that opportunity. You can find that opportunity. If you're in a job that you are not happy with, then I would say, get out. You, you can make your future, get out and network, make the time, make, take some time to, wrap up that LinkedIn account, <laughs> make it look nice. And, and remember that there is support out there for you. Um, and that there are other people who have been in your shoes and will have your back. Um, and, and truly I would say it goes back to 
be the be the kind of boss like no, no matter what position you are in be the kind of boss like act like the kind of boss you would want and i think a lot of people will get into positions of power and haze other people because that's how they were treated mm -hmm. so it's just remembering that you know be the kind of person you want to work with so if, if you are that person um and you know I, I like i said back to like some of the the young people that i mentor i tell them you know there will be a time it's almost i could put a million dollars on it right now there will be a time in your career where you're at a job and it you will either have nightmares about the job the climate that you're working in you will have anxiety that is unbelievable and you may be put in situations that are not okay and you have but you have to be your own voice and to stand up and walk away now i i will say my parents always also said never never leave a job without a job yeah. because that is true it's much easier to find a job when you have a job yes. um but but yeah that's just <laughs> one little nibble of advice very passionate love it love it tell us about the darkest time of your life how you got through that, and what did you learn from that experience? Um, okay. Um, one of the darkest times um, of my life was in my late 20s. And, um, you know, uh, I'd gone through a breakup, and I was not happy in the position that I was in um, at work. And, um, truly my friends and my family were my saving grace. I would, um, I would sometimes cry on the way to work, um, call my mom and dad in the morning. They would always like, you know, pet me up, make me feel better. And sometimes during lunch, I would just sit in the bathroom and cry. Um, because it was, it was just a, a really difficult, um, experience. But then with work, it was, it was as if every door around me was getting closed. And I had an epiphany where I realized I am the only one that can open this door. And so I actually, um, I went to my boss and I said, I have three offers, job offers from other studios. I will be accepting one of these by this Friday. And I just want to let you know, cause I'd love to continue to work here, but I can't under these circumstances. And the boss at the time looked at me and said, you know, I don't want to lose you. What will it take? And I said, I need two weeks of vacation beyond what I need. I just need to go take two weeks. I knew I, I knew at that moment, okay, he's responding. I need to take a moment because I knew what I needed. I needed a mental break because I hadn't had one in a long time. And I said, I need two weeks vacation and I want this management position and that basically it was kind of open, but not totally open because it wasn't really there. It was kind of like, I knew, that, I knew that there were talks of it getting created. And he said, okay. And I was, I was lucky because not everybody gets that opportunity to get out of a dark place. And um, one of the things I would say, if I could go back to my younger 20, you know, something self, <laughs> um, I wish I could remind her, me, um, yes. no person should ever steal your sparkle. And, um, it wasn't till a few years later that some one near and dear to me said that my father had said that, you know, that someone had stolen, so stolen my sparkle and it was hard for him to see that. Right. And it really resonated with me because it was true that like my sparkle was dimming and, but it goes back to remembering you can always open another door and if it feels closed, just find another door. True. True that. I think I know the answer, but you can share with us. Who was the most influential person for you growing up? It was my dad and my mom, for <laughs> sure. You know, I um, have the craziest parents. They are so much fun and so loving and kind. But they truly instilled a lot in in me and have made me a big part of, like, uh, who I am today is because of my mom and dad. And But really have been super supportive, especially with my career, especially with all the crazy ups, downs, and changes. Um, but they both gave me advice that has always rung to true. And, um, one would be that, um, my dad would always say, cause I'm a bit sassy. Um, my dad would always say, it's not what you say, it's how you say it. And I think that's really true in business, especially, um, you know, you can say F you to somebody 
and that's very clear what that is. But sometimes you have to stand your ground and, and be stern with people, but it's never, it's not necessarily what you're saying, it's how you say it. So sometimes you can still be stern, but to remember your tone. And my mom, the biggest piece of advice that she always said was, you never know who's watching you. Just like that time when I was starting at MGM where the president was watching me and I got a job offer because I'd been working my tail off to the time even before that when I was at Mizzou being an on-camera reporter in Mexico on a booze cruise and a family was like watching me and said, hey, aren't you on the news in Missouri? <laughs> you know, but luckily I was not acting a fool. Um, to even, even now, um, you know, I've gotten two massive clients I haven't announced because they've been watching, one has been watching me on social media and the other, um, saw an event that I did for a competitor. So you truly don't ever know who's watching you. So it's good to make sure you're always acting your best, looking your best and feeling your best. Amen. Again. So I'm going to read a quote that you said, and okay. I want you to tell me what you think or what your thoughts are. You once said that style is a look into someone's soul. What do you mean by that? Because I feel like one thing that I've learned when it comes about first impressions is that it's not just about what you're wearing. It's about the energy that you put off. And I do believe that style can, your style, when you walk in a room, what you're, it's an expression. And when people are expressing themselves, they can express their souls. I, I've had a lot of different clients and, you know, beyond just the events and all of that, I've helped a lot of women with their fashion and men. But I find that um, people quite often, what they're feeling on the inside, they express on the outside with their clothing and whether they're depressed or whether they feel overweight, whether they are a worn out mom or a woman who's going through a divorce. Um, a lot of times what that soul is feeling will be expressed in what they're wearing, how they take care of themselves. And so I really do believe that we as people express ourselves through style, through fashion. And, and I do believe style is so much more than the clothing that you put on. It's, you know, style is so much more than those kicks you're wearing or, you know, the cute dress you're, you're rocking. It's, it's beyond that. Nice. So you can be walking down the street and look at someone like, hmm, I think they might be going through this or that. I will tell you, yes, I absolutely can. Um, and I think that's also goes back to the, just being just being conscious of the human to human experience around you. And um, one thing I also learned from my parents is you never know what someone may be going through. There can be a smile on the outside, but they can be hurting on the inside or they, you know, they could be so rude to you, but they may be had a really rough day. And if you were them, you would be even worse than they're acting right now. So um, I try to be conscious of that, too. But I will say, um, yeah, I've. I've I've asked people before kind of bluntly and, you know, when I've noticed things and, um, and usually been pretty spot on. Nice. We're going to go up to Starbucks after this. We're going <laughs> to we sit are. there. We're just going to be like, hmm, we're going to make a couple of wagers and we'll see what people are doing. <laughs> Let's do it. <laughs> what is the one lesson in life that took you the longest to learn? Oh my gosh. I would say one of the, the things that I, it took a long time to learn would be trust. And I'm, I'm one of those people, um, I open with trust because I, that's how I come to the table. I'm, an ex I'm a Leo, I'm a lion. I am very loyal, extremely loyal, but almost to a fault. And I say that because in business, um, it can be difficult to always, to understand someone's intention because some people will put other people's affairs, their, you know, anything ab above, their own success. But I find that often people that do that, um, karma's a bitch and <laughs> karma is a bigger bitch than I ever will be. <laughs> so I would say, you know, being trusting. So whether it is trusting a new client without having a contract in place, don't do it. Um, <laughs> whether it's, you know, having a business partner who takes a business you've built together and then goes to close a deal and cuts you out of it. Mm -hmm. Had it happen. Um, these things, what I think a lot of people forget is like, these things aren't, don't, don't just affect business. They can affect friendships. They can affect your life, but also just you, even you as an individual, as a person. So, um, 
trusting it's I wouldn't say it's not that I don't trust people now I'm just more cautious with that trust I I try to learn observe more you know I'm one of those people um you know I'm a talk I I love to talk I'm not the person in the corner observing everyone but I love and admire um people that are like that because usually they are the smartest person in the room not the person that's talking (laughs) and so um I've learned a lot about that from mentors of my own of taking time to build trust in business. Good. Every great person has a sentence. What is your sentence? For example, my sentence would be, I help people unlock their creativity by teaching them how to DJ. What would your sentence be? My sentence would be, I help people put their most fashionable foot forward and teach them how to make the best first impression they can. Well, good. Good job. (laughs) What is one new habit you've added to your daily routine in the past year or so that has been most beneficial? I would say one of the things that I've had to add to my routine is creating, I I look at a list that I have. I have a, a goal list and I look at that almost on a daily basis. It's it's kept in my notes on my phone. Um, there are very few people who have seen that um, because I have learned only you can be accountable for your goals. And, and truly, you've got to put that on yourself. Um, and sometimes it's good to hold things a little close to your heart and not share <laughs> them so much right. because if they don't come through, um, which when you whether you're working for yourself or you're working for a company or you're trying to get that next job or that raise, if you talk too much about it and then it doesn't happen, it can be, it's even harder. Um, and so that's one of the things I've, I've done starting this year was to essentially like the secret back in, when did that happen? The early 2000s. Mid 2000s. Uh, yeah. So, um, but like really envision what I have because I, it goes back to what I had a mentor tell me, Kajiti, you've got these beautiful big goals, but let's not forget about the 50 goals from now till then. And so that's what I've started doing. And it's helped a lot. Good. Now, we're big readers here on the Money Experience Podcast. So if there was one, two or three books that you feel people should stop what they're doing right now and start to read them immediately, what books would those be? Yes. Okay. <laughs> You can check and look up as much as you like. You know, actually, what I'm going to say is I <laughs> I would tell you something. I love knowing what's going on around me, what's, what's happening in L.A. I love hearing about the latest fashion trends. And I am way more of a like a social reader. I'm way more of a, a, like a blog reader and Instagram follower and Pinterest. And so I would say um, one website to check out would be LA Confidential because they're always they they've got a great calendar of events. They've got fantastic celebrities that they are always highlighting, but also what's new, what's trending. And I'm a big person on finding out like I love to see what's next, like what fashion, events, technology, whatever it may be. Mm-hmm. Um there was a book that Maria Shriver wrote many years ago and I read that numerous times through college and even post college and it was very beneficial. Okay. We'll, we'll find the title of that book. We'll add it to the show notes. <laughs> yes. Good. Any other Wait. books come to mind or anything else? That's a good one right there. We yeah. can stick with that. We'll stick with that. We'll <laughs> stick with that. <laughs> great, great. We'll add that to I the I like show romance notes. novels. That's not going to help. You want to share a romance novel? Fifty week? Shades of Grey. <laughs> okay. um, no, I'm just kidding. Not really. Um, <laughs> good. So. Tell people how they can find you online. Okay. Well, you can find me on Instagram and Pinterest at Style on the Spot and Facebook please follow me. I'm doing all kinds of fun things. Uh, It's a great place to learn about what events I have coming up. Even if you don't live here, um, I love to talk about um, trends that are happening and new brands, um, new designers, all kinds of fun stuff. Um, And I actually have a few products that will be coming out later this year. All right. Um, The other place you can find me is on my blog, which is styleonthespot.com. So check it out and um, would love to, you know, to hear from you. If you've got any fun ideas or collaborations, always reach out. Fantastic. So I got to sneak in a little fashion advice. 
I need from you. Trying to figure out what's Always. next for me. So I love to rock my sweater vest. And your bow ties. My bow ties, tailored <laughs> suits. Like, what's what can I have? What's next for me? I would say right now, the, the trending thing for men would be the, the tailored suit, but the shorter length in the pants. Now, not everybody can rock that, but then the frustrating part is, too, that trend could only last a couple of years, <laughs> then you've spent all this money on a suit that then your pants look too, like your high water. Right. Now, you're a fashionable guy, so you can definitely pull it off. <laughs> um, but I would say the personalized um, bow ties. I could see you doing where you oh. could have one that says Amani like, in a cool kind of font um i like it that would be one you know the, and along with the matching little yeah, scarf like a scarf for the um okay. i'm a big fan too with men's watches i love wearing big watches and so okay. i'll send you a couple links on that please do i think one of the other styles that i saw in europe um that i i'm starting to see here now is with men's dress shoes having the laces be a bright color like the thin laces bright color so whether you're wearing you know brown dress shoes and with a purple lace or a navy lace or a red lace. I saw that in Cannes two years ago and I'm seeing here now in Los Angeles, which means it'll hit the rest of the country in a year. <laughs> two or three more years. Nebraska, you'll see it in a year. <laughs> wow. um, so no, that's that's kind of the cool thing. I think I like seeing that because you dress up, you, you've you got a great style, Amani. Thank you. I'm trying, you know, I'm trying to stick with it. So thank you. I'm, I'm, I like that personalized tie and okay, we got some work to do. Yeah, I'll help you. Cool, cool. So definitely want to say Thank you for being on the show. Um, like, I love to hear about your story, about where you've come from. I respect the hustle. Like, you've been in business for 15, 60 years on your own, but you've been multitasking, started working when you're a freshman or sophomore in school. Yeah. Like, long time. I, I respect the grind. I love working with you. We have fun. We're going to work together some more. So that's exciting. Yes, absolutely. And so, you know, just thank you for being on the show. And I, I love watching your ascension because I remember I met you through Paula. We were at the Marina Del Rey Marriott for yes. someone's birthday or yes. something. And, and the um, outdoor bar. I remember that with the fire right. pits. Yes. Glow. Good glow. Yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. We were there. And um, since then, we've been friends and I've just yes. watched your ascension. So keep going. Thank you. I appreciate it. You know, we've got some big events that we're going to be working with each other on hopefully coming up soon. For those of you that are mommies, I've got a great Mom's Day Out event at The Point here in El Segundo. It's going to be a fabulous event. Um, Mom's Day Out of drinking, <laughs> eating, getting pampered. Um, and it'll be another wonderful Style in the Spot event. Yes, it will. So we love to let our guests leave with a little bit of words of wisdom or advice. So I'm going to turn the microphone over to you to say thanks again and take us home all right um you know it's thank you for this experience i do love how you talk to women that are empowering other women empowering just individuals um causes i'm a big fan of that and i think that i think if we all could take a little bit of that amani experience and <laughs> expand it into our lives um we'd all be in a better place i'd say you know for those of you that are that are here and listening, um, you're already taking a step further in your own career, in your own path, by learning from other people, listening to other people, laughing at other people. You can <laughs> laugh at me all day. I don't mind. With you too. <laughs> yeah, and um, and truly, um, and truly, that's a big part of I think our society. I think the next generation. If you're young and you're getting out of school or right out of school, a little ways. Um, one of the biggest things that I say when I go to mentor and when I speak to these classes at some of the local universities is I look around and I see um, who's on their phone or who's kind of in their own space. And it's remembering to be present. And um, I had a girl at the end, just recently at the end of a talk say, you know, Kachita, could you tell us the reason why people aren't hiring millennials and I, and, or why, you know, when we get out of school, what may be difficult? And I said, there's about 60 in this class that I've seen on your phones. And that means you weren't present. And what you don't know is that I never forget a face. And if seven, eight years from now, I were to interview you, I probably wouldn't offer you the job. And I said, so remember, a first impression is everything. So it goes, I would just take it back to that. Remember, what you put out is what you'll receive. And karma is a bigger bitch than you ever could be. <laughs> but she is preaching to us on a Thursday. I hey, love it. Thank amen. You. Amen. And for that, we're out. <laughs> Thank you for listening to the Amani Experience Podcast. You can check out the show notes on amaniexperience.com slash podcast. Please remember to leave us a review on the platform you are listening on and share this podcast with anyone who you feel would benefit from listening. See you soon on our next episode.